Let's turn to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. I am so glad you're here. Real quickly, tomorrow is the, uh, the 16th anniversary of 9-11. Can you believe that? 16 years ago tomorrow. And um, it's a day that none of us ever forgets. It's a day that we simply call 9-11. And when you say 9-11, everybody immediately knows exactly what we're talking about. 16 years tomorrow uh, from that day. Debbie and I, a couple weeks ago, were in uh, New York City. We had a chance to go to Ground Zero. We went to the um, 9-11 Memorial and Museum there at the spot at Ground Zero. It's a place of, uh, that's so surreal to me, a place of tragedy and triumph, a place of loss, and also a place of hope. I think it's a place that everybody in America should go see and visit, just personally. But with that being said, tomorrow as you begin your day, as you go to work, as you go to school, wherever you're at tomorrow, would you say a prayer tomorrow for every person who has been impacted because of 9-11, either personally or indirectly? And as you're praying for them, would you also pray for our men and women that are still in uniform, who either have served because of 9-11, or they're still serving today, trying to protect and defend our freedoms all across this world. So tomorrow when you are getting out and doing your things, would you remember to pray for them? Amen? Because this is something we should never forget. Amen. Bow us in prayer. Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you today, Lord, for the privilege of just being together in your house uh, to, to love you, to serve you, to worship you, to glorify your name. And we pray, Holy Spirit that you would enable us, Lord, to say, Lord, the things that you have birthed in our spirit for this day, for this hour. God, we pray, Lord, for Lord, the, the, the victims of 9-11, their families, for those that were impacted. God, we pray your peace upon them, Lord, still. Even 16 years later, God, we pray still their peace upon their lives. We pray for our, those that have served in the military, those that are still serving in the military, that, God, that you would protect them, help them, encourage them, and be with them, Lord. God, and be with us today. Be with us, Lord, as we, God, uh, just being here in your house to, to learn more about you, to hear from you. Be for those in Florida, God, that are being impacted by Hurricane Irma and those who in the, those islands that have already been impacted. Lord Jesus, every day we just have to trust in you. Every day we just have to look to you because you are our help, you are our source, and you are our strength. And we love you with all of our heart and we give you thanks and praise in all things. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. amen. I will trust. Say that with me. I will trust trust. One more time. I will trust. We said last week that trust by definition simply means that it's the belief that someone or something is reliable, that it's good, that it's honest, that it's effective. It's an an assured reliance on the character and the ability and the strength and the truthfulness of someone or something. In other words, it's having the utmost confidence. And so when we say, I will trust in Jesus, because that's what the I will trust means, I will trust in Jesus, what we're actually saying is, is that we have the utmost confidence in Him, that we know that we can still rely on Him to cause all things. Everybody say all things. That we can still rely on Him to cause all things, even the things that we don't understand, to still work together for our good. See, last week we talked about trusting in God in spite of our circumstances, in spite of what we think, In spite of what we see, in spite of how we feel, and how that is only accomplished when we truly believe that God loves us and has nothing but good intentions and plans for our future lives. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. They are to give you a future and to give you a hope. Those were words that were spoken by, by God to the children of Israel this covenant people of his in the midst of their imprisonment and the midst of their dispersion in Babylon. He wanted them to know that he had not forgotten about them. He wanted them to know that his purposes for their future lives were still filled with hope. They were still filled with good. They were still filled with joy. They were still filled with promise that he had a future still in store for them. And guess what? God one day fulfilled that promise to them. He did. Listen, never be afraid to trust an an unknown future to a known God. That's what Corey Ten Boone said after she survived the concentration camp during World War II. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. 
We may not understand. We may not know what tomorrow may bring, but we can still trust the God who holds all of our tomorrows. And then I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He says, we cannot always trace God's hand, but we can always trace God's heart. Meaning this, many times in the crucibles of life, we don't have the answer to all of the reasons why. We don't always understand. But because we know that God loves us with an everlasting love, we can still trust in Him. Am I right? Today I'm going to change directions in a sense because I want to become a little bit more specific in what we can trust God for. Last week it was trusting God in spite of our circumstances because His ultimate purposes are good. Therefore, He gives us a future and a hope. For the next few weeks, we're going to actually be looking at trusting in God's provision, trusting in His power, and trusting in His presence. I want us to look in 1 Kings 17. I love this story. We're talking today about trusting in God's provision. How many understands that God is a provider? Amen. How many believes that, that God is a provider? Amen. He does. He does provide. Trusting in God's provision. 1 Kings chapter 17. How many is there? Say yes. yes. Boy, I like that. I want to look at verse 8. We're going to start in verse number 8. It says here, verse 8, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Elijah, everybody say Elijah. You may not know who that is. I recommend that everybody find out who Elijah is. There is an Elijah in the Old Testament and there is an Elisha. Elijah was the predecessor of Elisha, a great prophet in the land of Israel. He's one of those prophets that everybody needs to know. So the Bible says that the Lord said to Elijah, Elijah had been causing quite a, quite a stir in Israel. He had prayed for it not to rain. And guess what? The rain had stopped. And rain continued to stop and the crops began to die and the streams were beginning to dry up and King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were trying to hunt him down because they didn't like the fact that Elijah prayed and the rain stopped falling. So the Lord said to Elijah, verse 8, Go and live, verse 9, in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon, for I have instructed a widow there to feed you. Elijah, if you were reading a little bit before this, Elijah's being fed by ravens, so I'm sure that he was a little bit excited when God says, Elijah, it's time to move. It's time to get up and to go somewhere else. I'm moving you somewhere else. And that is until he heard God say where he was moving him to. I'm moving you to Zarephath. The word Zarephath actually comes from a word that means to smelt, to test or to refine by means of suffering. Zarephath was not San Diego. It was not San Antonio. It, it, was, it was not Denver. It was not Seattle. This was not on anybody's top 100 best places to visit in the Middle East. This place, Zarephath, had a, had a reputation of being a desolate place, a hard place, and a difficult place. And I'm sure that when Elijah heard that God was sending him to Zarephath, he wasn't too thrilled. He probably looked at God and says, Okay, God, here we go again. It's like it doesn't get any better. We go from one bad situation seemingly to the next. I'm sending you, Elijah, to Zarephath. I'm sending you to a place of testing. I'm sending you to a place of difficulty and hardship. I'm sending you to a place that has a reputation of suffering. So he went to Zarephath, verse 10. And as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, And bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I only have a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of this jug and I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. I don't know if we can, but I want us to try to capture what's happening in this story. Elijah is first and foremost a foreigner in the city of Zarephath. He is a foreigner in this land of suffering, this village of suffering, and there's a famine. There's a famine that's taking place, and the reason there's a famine that is taking place is because why? Because Elijah prayed for it not to rain. They're suffering in Zarephath beyond the normal suffering because 
Elijah who is there is the very one who prayed for it not to rain. And now he enters into this very depressed village and he takes notice of this little lady, this tired woman who is gathering sticks. And instead of helping her, instead of saying, ma'am, can I help you pick up sticks? Because, you know, that's what us southerners would do. We would say, ma'am, let me help you get the sticks. But instead of him helping this lady get sticks, he looks at her and he says, could you bring me a cup of water? And as she's looking at him and starting towards the well, and he's like, and I, oh, by the way, something to eat as well. The Bible already told us that she was a widow woman, meaning that there's no man to work. There's no man to help take care of her. There's no man to provide for her. She has no protector. She has no caregiver. And because her husband is dead, her son is small, she has no hope for a future. That's what's happening here. She's living not one day at a time. She's living literally one meal at a time. This is her existence. But now she says even that's over because she only has enough for one more piece of bread. When all of a sudden this stranger, this foreigner, he asks her for a cup of water and for her last meal that she was going to give to her son and a little bit to herself. You talk about suffering. This is Zarephath. This is a, the, the city of suffering. She wasn't visiting the city. She was living it. This is her life. In fact, it seems like her life had been one point of, point of suffering after the next. But Elijah says to her, verse 13, he says, don't be afraid. He says, you go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. In other words, if you're going to make some bread for yourself, I understand, go ahead, but make some for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. I'm not sure what this lady must have been thinking at Elijah's request, but I highly, it's highly unlikely that she was thinking anything super spiritual at the moment. You understand? Some people, when you talk to them, it's always super spiritual. I got a feeling this is not her. She's living in the moment. She doesn't know Elijah. She did not serve his God, and I'm sure that she probably thought this dude was crazy. He's out of his mind. What do you mean? Give you a cup of water and give you my last piece of bread, and if I do this, that somehow your God is going to meet all of my needs. She probably thought he could take a flying leap somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Before she gave up her son's last meal. But then I got a feeling that she began to look at her life. She began to look at her situation. That she looked at the frailty of her son. She saw the bones beginning to protrude through his skin. She probably looked at the mirror and she saw how thin she had become. How baggy her clothes were now up on her. How her cheeks were now protruding through her own skin. And she probably thought, our future's already bleak. If this is what the Lord God of Israel says that we can do and this is what he'll do, what do I have to lose? You ever been in one of those places where you thought to yourself, what do I have, what do I have to lose? What do I have to lose? I might as well because it can't get worse than this. And so she says, what's one more day of prolonged suffering? I might as well do what he says. And so verse 15, so she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days, and there was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Don't you love that story? I will trust in God's provision. Can I make three observations here? From this story, that I think that will be a blessing to all of us when it comes to him providing. First one is simply this. God always knows exactly where we are. Aren't you glad that God always knows where you are? Some of you may not like it, but he does. God always knows exactly where you are. I love the story of a guy by the name of George. George had a, just an incessant habit of always 
every morning going out and getting the newspaper, and the first thing that he would do was turn to the obituary column. For whatever, it was kind of a sick thing for him, but he loved it. He would get the paper, look in the obituary column, the first thing he would look at to see who had died. See if he knew anybody in there. Don't raise your hand in that shoe, but that was him. Every day George would do that first thing in the morning. And some of George's friends knew that he did that. So one day they decided they were going to play a joke on George. They got a picture of George, put it in the newspaper in the obituary column, wrote a biography all about him, and there it was. And so the next day George wakes up, opens up the newspaper, turns to the obituary column, looks on the second page of the column, and there he sees it. He sees his picture. He sees his name. He sees his biography. And he's startled. This is me. So he calls up his friend Bob. Bob, do you have the newspaper? You do? Turn to the obituary column. Hurry. Look on the second page. What do you see? And there's this long pause on the phone. George, holy smoke, it's you! Where are you calling from, George? <laughs> Anybody ever felt like nobody knew where you were? And I'm not talking about being able to find you on the GPS. I'm talking about nobody knows where you are. You feel like it because they don't know what's in here. Or they don't know what's going on in here. And you feel like nobody really knows really where you're at. This inner turmoil. You feel lost. You feel forgotten. You feel alone. Listen, life is filled with all kinds of pains. All kinds of disappointments. All kinds of heartaches. Our state, our city, our community has been dealing with it especially hard these last couple of weeks. Florida is getting it today and tomorrow is a reminder that we've been dealing with it for a very long time. And sometimes we feel like, as we're going through those things, Charlie Brown, we feel like him standing at the, on the beach after he's made this beautiful sand castle. He's standing there just looking at it. When all of a sudden the heavens open and the rains pour down and boom, it's gone. And he looks at it and he thinks to himself, there must be a lesson here but I have no idea what it is. We can feel that way. Am I right? Listen, nobody has said these past few weeks in the homes that we've tried to help in, that nobody has said to us, I don't understand God in this. Not a single person. We've helped so many people, not only in, King, in Spring, but also in, we help people in Kingwood, we help people in Aldine, we help people in East Houston. Nobody ever said to us, I don't understand God in this. But you could sense it in their voice. And you could see it in their eyes. That feeling of confusion. That sense of loss. That wondering if God even knows where we are. And sometimes we feel like the little city boys on the camping trip go out into the deep woods and Mosquitoes are so thick and they're so fierce that they pull the blanket over their heads to try to keep the mosquitoes off of them when all of a sudden one of the little boys sees a lightning bug. And he says, boys, we're in trouble. They're coming at us with flashlights. <laughs> because that's how we feel. That no matter where we go, it's always there. See, life is, life is sometimes hard. Sometimes it's hard to hold on, especially when you feel isolated and alone. That's this woman in this story in 1 Kings 17. She has no husband. She has no income. She has no more money to buy food. Her son is weak. She's weak. And now she's just getting ready to die. She's going to cook this final meal. And then she says, we're going to just die. One of the men that we helped, he told me as he sat in his chair, he looked out and he says, there's my life belongings, it's all out there. And now really, he said, Pastor, I'll be honest with you, I'm just sitting here waiting to die. He told me that. But here's the deal. The Lord saw her and knew exactly where she was at and what she was going through, just like he sees us. And he knows always exactly where we're at and exactly what we're going through. 
Is Jesus up on the mountain praying? Remember the story? Jesus tells his disciples, hey guys, you get in the boat, you go to the other side, I'm going to go on the mountain and pray. And while he's up on the mountain praying, they're going through a storm in the middle of the sea. They're toiling, they're laboring just to get across the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is on top of the mountain, he sees them. And what does he do? He just comes walking on the water. Why? Because the storms of life never faze Jesus. And he's always able to get to us, even through the waves and the wind. He's always able to come. Because we're never out of his sight. See, the Bible says that the Lord came to Elijah and he says to him, Go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon, for I have instructed a widow there to feed you. Now, when you read that, that direction, it's, it's actually a play on words. We think that somehow that God has already instructed this widow woman that she's to be looking for Elijah, that she's supposed to feed him, but that's, that's not really how it is. It's just the way it sounds. It's a play on words. The reality is, is that God is saying that he has picked out a lady that he has purposely planned a divine encounter with. He sees her. He knows that she's struggling to survive. And so he has picked her out and he's sending Elijah to her. He's not instructing her to just to take care of him. He's sending more of Elijah to say her. I love that. Meaning simply this, it wasn't happenstance that Elijah meets her right after he enters into the village. It wasn't accidental that she happened to be there picking up sticks. God saw where she was at. He knew her situation. And he purposefully prepared this divine moment for the salvation of her household. God always, always knows where you are at. You are never out of his sight. He knows where you are. So the song says, his eye is on the sparrow. And I know, I know that I know that he watches over me. His eye, he knows where we're at. The second thing we see here is that God always knows exactly what we need. He first, he sees where we're at. See, it stands to reason if he sees where I'm at, then he knows what I have need of as well, right? See, God knew Elijah was going to need a place to stay because King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were going to be looking for him, and so he sends him to a place that they would never think to look, the city of suffering, right outside of Sidon. But he also knew that there was a widow woman and her son who needed a miracle as well. And so the Lord arranges this divine encounter. We've had so many divine encounters these last couple of weeks. Not happenstance, not accidental, divine encounters. Oh, we would get specific calls, but then we would have these moments where we just met somebody. Case in point, and I'll just share this one. It was about a little precious lady. Pastor Steve was leading a team and just working at a nearby house and meets this lady. Speaks to her about maybe coming to help her, but she's not ready because she's waiting for the insurance to come in. She was a little widow lady. Kind of sounds like the lady of Zarephath. But Steve gave her the phone number. Pastor Steve gave her the phone number of the church and says, well, you get ready. Just give us a call. And a few days later, she did. She called. And for days, three days, our teams were out there. Went... We see Thursday, yeah, Thursday, Friday, and yesterday, Saturday, working at this little widow lady's house every day, just trying to help with all that she was looking at, all that she was dealing with. And this is what she said to me on Friday. She said this to me. She said, I was praying and wondering what I was going to do. Then God sent me all of you. You're my angels. You're my angels. I just said that to simply say this. God always knows exactly what we have need of. And when you get to that place, God can send angels. 
This widow woman at Zarephath was at the end of a rope. It's kind of like the elephant that's hanging off the edge of the cliff. He's got his trunk wrapped around a little daisy flower trying to hang on. It ain't going to happen. That's this little lady. She's going over. But the Lord sent her Elijah. See, in that moment, Elijah was like Jesus who had the encounter with the lame man by the pool of Bethesda who said, I've got nobody to put me in. Yet Jesus came on the scene. In that moment, he was like... Jesus, who happened to interrupt the, the funeral procession, that procession as it was taking the little boy to the main graveyard to, to put him in the grave, but came in encounter with Jesus. All I'm saying is this. He knows exactly what we have need of. And when Elijah got to Zarephath, when Elijah came to the city of suffering, for this woman, everything was about to change. God knows where you're at. God knows what you have need of. And here's the last one. God always makes a way. God always, always, always makes a way. Sometimes we don't see how. Sometimes it, we've got, we don't have the answer. But God makes a way. I've shared this story a zillion times. You can probably tell the story better than I, but I can't help it. It's my life. It's Debbie and our life. And when I come back to it every time, I'm talking about trusting in God's provision. When Debbie was pregnant with our twins, she ran into complications. And uh, at, the, at 29 weeks, Debbie went into full term labor. She spent a week in the hospital. They were giving her all kinds of shots, all kinds of medicine, IVs in her, trying to stop the labor, stop the twins from coming. They were giving her the steroid shots in case the babies were born that to help the lungs not be sticky so maybe they would have a chance to breathe and survive. 29 weeks, she has full-term labor. They were able to stop it. They released her to go home, and then they put her on full-time bed rest. She's got an IV constantly in her leg, giving her medicine to keep the... Uh, babies from coming. She wears a fetal monitor all the time. Uh, we have medicine being sent to the house. We have a nurse coming out uh, nearly uh, every other day or every day to check on her, to check everything. We had called the insurance. The insurance company said it was covered. Our doctors called the insurance and they told our doctors that it was covered. Hallelujah. Debbie carried the twins till 38 weeks. The babies were born. They were both healthy, both well. We took them both home uh, after they were born. They didn't have to stay any extra days. It was just a miracle of the Lord. And then, a few weeks after that, we got the bill. When the insurance company said that the people that spoke to us, the people that spoke to, the, to our doctors, had no authorization to say anything was covered. It wasn't covered. And this is what you're going to have to pay. I was 26 years old. You know, just a kid. <laughs> looking at this enormous debt. And I told him, I said, listen... I'll pay you guys $25 a month for the rest of my life, but that's all I can do. And we began to make those payments, $25 a month, $25 a month, $25 a month. And I'll never forget it. It's, in, just, it's ingrained in my memory. The Wednesday night before church when the phone rang, and it was the c corporate company for the home care calling us from the state of California to let us know that they had decided... <laughs> that they were going to write everything off except for $1,000. All that enormous bill, they were just going to write it off except for $1,000. I, I was, Debbie and I, I don't know if our feet touched the ground. We floated to church maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Got to church and we shared what God had just done for us. And Reverend A.L. Todd, who's gone on to be with Jesus now for a long time, he stood up after I shared our testimony. He says, I think the miracle's not complete yet. I'll give the first $100. And nine other people stood up and gave another $100 to match him. And we walked out of that service that night with our debt completely paid. All I'm saying, amen. All I'm saying is simply this to everybody here. God always makes a way. And he makes a way where there seems to be no way. It's just like God, it comes out of the blue. It's like, where did that come from? I've heard so many stories just like that. But that's my story. 
And I can share my story like you can share your story. It's the story of the fact that God sees where we're at. He knows what we have need of and he always makes a way. I think about the Apostle Paul. I love the Apostle Paul. So instrumental in the spread of the gospel across the Roman Empire. So instrumental in the writing of the New Testament. Yet he suffered so much. So many trials. He was beaten. He was stoned with rocks. He was left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He experienced it all. Being a missionary evangelist in his day and age was extremely challenging and difficult, but he never lost his faith nor surrendered his hope. In fact, in one of his prison epistles, writes it from prison, he writes in Philippians 4. This is where our theme for the year comes from. I know how to live on almost nothing. Verse 12. Or with everything, I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty stomach, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And then he writes in verse 18, as he's sitting in a prison cell, at the moment I have all that I need and more. And then he says this, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying that God will provide. He will provide no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, God always provides. If we're faithful, if we'll step out in faith, if we'll believe, if we'll walk in obedience, if we'll trust in God's provision, God always supplies. See, I love this story of this widow lady in Zarephath. See, Elijah says, don't be afraid. Go ahead, do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour, always be olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. And the Bible says that this widow woman did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. And there was always enough flour and enough olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. We have to learn to trust in God's provision. He always provides. He knows where you're at. He knows what you have need of. And he will always give you exactly what you need to come through it. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, I have been old, but now I've been young, but now I'm old. But I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread, wine, because God always supplies exactly what we have need of. He does. We just got to trust in God's provision. He is a provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. As Abraham said, as he was getting ready to sacrifice Isaac and God stayed his hand and provided the ram into the thicket, he said, he is Jehovah Jireh, the God who always provides exactly what I have need of. In the hour of my need, God always makes a way. Amen. Stand together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Anybody thankful that we have a God that provides? Uh, how, many, how many, do this with me this morning. How many would lift your hand and say, I have a testimony myself of God providing. Come on, let me just see your hand. You can lift your hand. You're a living, breathing testimony of the God who provides. Come on, keep it up. I want to look around. If you're here today and you're trying to figure it all out and you're wondering how God's going to do it, look at the hands that were raised. Those are living testimonies of what I'm saying is true. And I will trust in His provision because I know He sees me where I'm at. I know that He knows exactly what I have need of. And He always will make a way. So keep on believing. You may relate to the widow woman in Zarephath. You may be in a in the place of suffering this morning. God knows where you are. He knows what you need. And I'm going to just tell you right now, if you walk in obedience to him, he will make a way. He will make a way. Bow your heads with me. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. You're so good. You're so faithful. Lord, a lot of hands that were raised that just that spoke of answered prayer. A lot of hands that were raised that spoke of the reality that they themselves are living testimonies of 
your providing hand. But Lord, I can tell you right now, there are people here this morning who are in that place of suffering, that place of challenge and difficulty, and they're just saying, Lord, I'm believing. I don't know where it's going to come from, but I'm believing. I don't know where, how it's going to happen. I'm just believing. And I pray, Lord, that you would just reveal yourself to them in a dynamic and a very special way by the Holy Spirit. That they would sense your presence and know that you are with them. That you know where they are and that you're going to provide. Let's do this real quickly. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You're here real quickly and you would just simply lift your hand and say, Pastor Larry, I'm in a place of need today. Would you just lift your hand? I'm in a place of need today. It's not that God can't provide. I'm, I'm talking about I'm in a place of need today. Lift it up real high so I can see. I'm, I'm needing a miracle today. I see your hands. The Lord is our provider. He is our provision. Would you do me the honor? If you lifted your hand, would you come and stand and let us pray for you here across the front? This is nothing to be embarrassed about. This just gives us a place to pray with people, to give a point of contact. Because sometimes we've just got to have somebody to come and stand with us. The lady of Zarephath, she had Elijah to come and be there for her. We want to be there with you. We want to pray with you. We want to believe God with you for your need. I'm trusting God for His provision. I'm trusting God to supply and meet the need. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. I'm trusting Him. Anybody else would like to come and just stand with these great group that's come? You're not coming by yourself. You won't be alone. Anybody else want to join these? Hallelujah. I'd like to ask our, our prayer team, our staff to come and join us here in prayer. We could use your help with praying. Just to come and lay hands on shoulders and our directors, our board of directors, if you join us here, we want to pray for people. He sees us where we are. He knows what we have need of. And He is a provider. Ernie and Liz, come and join us. Help us to pray. Any of our ministry leaders, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Church, will you stretch your hand towards these that are standing here? Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray right now, Lord, for every single one of these. Lord, you know exactly where they are. God, they feel like maybe they're in that place of suffering, just trying to figure it all out. But Jesus, they are not alone. They're not forgotten. They're not lost. You have not for abandoned them or forsaken them. But God, you see exactly where they are. In the name of Jesus, we pray, God, for your divine hand of provision. That you would open up the windows of heaven and meet their need. In the name of Jesus, you see where they are, you know what they have need of, and God, you are able to make a way. So Lord, we believe right now in Jesus' name. Lord, as we walk in obedience to you, Lord, as we surrender ourselves and follow you, Lord, we know that you will come, and you will supply, and you will deliver, and you will make a way. So we pray provision right now in the name of Jesus. We pray provision in the name of Jesus for each and every one of these, Lord. Father, by your hand, by your hand, my God, Paul said, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So Lord, make a way, work a miracle, I pray, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And can we just do this by faith? You that are standing here, would you just lift your hands toward heaven and we just begin to by faith say, Lord, I receive. I receive, Lord, what you would have in my life. I receive the answer. I receive the miracle, Lord, in my life. I am going to walk in obedience. I'm going to walk in faithfulness. And I'm going to trust you because you are the provider of all things. You will make a way. You will make a way. You will make a way in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For all of you that are standing in the seats back here, God is the same God for you today. He will make a way. He will make a way. He will make a way. He is 
our Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. And I will trust in his provision. I will trust in his provision. I will trust in his supply. He is a miracle working God. And he is able. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. cannot see He will make a way